how to develop their minds, how to develop their communication skills, how to dress like a prospect rather than a suspect, how to stay away from negative people and develop the skills to make it in a global economy. Money makes it possible for me not to have to depend upon some government agency to make that happen. So as you look at yourselves, make it important that you find some way to use your talents and gifts that generate the income that allow you to control your destiny. I read something that said, either you control your destiny or someone else will. Here's the other thing. Repeat out to me, please. Take care of myself. Yeah, so you got to take care of yourself. I'm 63. I can do 140 push-ups non-stop after warming up. I couldn't do that when I was 20 years old. And the reason that I do that, the exercise reduces the possibility of cancer reoccurring by 32% or spreading by 30%. It helps to reverse the aging process and keeps you younger, keeps your mind sharper and allow me to take care of my temple so I can continue to do my work so that you can continue to do the good work that you were sent here to do. So you got to make it important to take care of yourself. Put that at the top of the list because you can't do well and can't do good work if you don't feel good. We don't want to be like the man who said, I, if I'd known I'd live this long, I'd have taken better care of myself. Here's something else. Repeat after me, please. OQP. Only quality people. Yes. Look at your relationships. And ask yourself the question, Jim Rohn would ask this question, what is this relationship doing to me? Sidney Poitier wrote a book called The Measure of a Man. I love the tapes because I love his voice. He said, when you go for a walk with someone, something happens without being spoken. He said, either you adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? MIT did a study, and the study indicated that you earned within two to three thousand dollars of your, your closest friends and associates earn. Who's impacting you? Who's in your ear? What influence do they have on you? Dr. Dennis Kimbrough said, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. So practice the principle of OQP, only quality people. And somebody's saying, Les, can I change them? No, it's a full-time job changing yourself. Some people are so negative, they'll walk into a dark room and begin to develop. My family members and friends call me crazy for going to seminars, spending money on books and tapes and going to seminars. When are you going to stop going? I said, when I die. That's when I stop. When does a man or woman die? When their dreams die. When do we die? When we stop developing ourselves, expanding our minds, challenging ourselves, raising the bar on ourselves. The best thinking that, that I had at that point in my life had produced this life that I have. I need some help on where Einstein was. He said, the thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. I applaud you for investing in yourself, for coming here, flying thousands of miles, investing money in yourself. I can tell you, based upon my own experience, you have something special. You have greatness within you. What you're doing is different. You represent only 2% of the planet. One great American said, I choose not to be a common man. It's my right to be uncommon if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dull by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, to fail and to succeed. I refuse to live from hand to mouth. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the still calm of utopia. I will never cow before the master, nor bend to any threat. It's my heritage to stand erect, proud and unafraid, to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. That's what it means to be a part of peak potentials. Your unquenching desire, an uncommon desire to manifest your greatness. Give yourselves a round of applause.
Thank you. The other thing is you look at your goals and look at your dreams. Repeat out to me, please. I will fail my way to success. Yes. Part of the reason why we have to continue to work on ourselves and surround ourselves with quality people is because you're going to have a lot of failures. You're going to have a lot of disappointments. Maya Angelou said, and it's true, I found it in my case, that most people go so far in life and then they park. They stop dead in their tracks. Why? Because they take some hits. When you have a goal and dream, think it not strange that you'll face the fiery furnaces of this world. You will have tribulations. Things are going to happen to you. I was in pursuit of my dream, and all of a sudden, boom, I got hit. A person that I thought I would be with for the rest of my life, I thought was my soulmate. I went through a divorce. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. How can I teach people how to live their dreams? And I wasn't able to make my marriage work. I questioned myself. I took another hit. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Then I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Then my best friend from the second grade, Alexander Wims, he was diagnosed with cancer of the liver. I took a hit and life staggered me and I parked. And I didn't turn on my emergency lights because I didn't want to call attention to myself. I didn't want anybody to come and say, hey, do you need a jump? No, I don't need a jump. I'm not out of gas. My battery is not dead. My heart is beating. I'm parked. Leave me be. I'm parked. I was in my comfort zone. I was doing just enough to get by. I was working on a job. They paid me just enough to keep me from quitting. And I worked just hard enough to keep from getting fired. How many know people like that? Blink your eyes if you understand what I'm talking about. I was parked. I knew I could do more. But when my mama died, it took something out of me. When I went through a divorce, it took something out of me. When, when my best friend died, it took something out of me. I parked. And somebody said that life is like an onion. You have to peel it one layer at a time. And sometimes you cry. Life's going to happen to you when you have a dream. You're going to get slapped around. And don't take it personal. Don't ask, why did this have to happen to me? Why not you? Who would you suggest? You want to give us some names, some email addresses? And don't tell everybody. 80% don't care and 20% glad is you. It's called life. Suck it up and move on. Get over it. It happens to everybody. Here's the other thing is you look at your goals and look at your dreams. When you're going through some stuff, repeat out to me please. When things go wrong, don't go with them. Yes, write that down. When things go wrong, don't go with them. When you're working on a business deal, you're counting on some money. Someone said you will get the loan and it falls through. You have an event and the people that you thought would be there and support you, they don't come through. Or someone turns against you or you get ripped off. It's going to happen to you. It happened to me. Someone stole all my products. My database, over 180,000 names and addresses. It's not personal. It's going to happen to everybody. It does. Eight out of ten millionaires have been financially bankrupt. Walt Disney had seven. He filed bankruptcy seven times and had two nervous breakdowns. It's called life. But I got a saying, when life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. You've got the power in you to do that. You've got something special. You've got comeback power. Here's the other thing. Let us say together, it's possible. It's necessary. It's me. Yes, write that down. It's me. Take ownership for your life. Nobody can live your dream for you but you. Nobody's going to take care of your business like you. Stop coming up with excuses. 
Don't give yourself permission to continue to live a small life. You can't fit a big dream into a small life. Give yourself permission to go for it, to test yourself, to challenge yourself, to live full. I like the saying, always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded. The reason you're here is because there's something in you that says, I can do more. This just can't be it. There's something in you, there's a calling on your life. There's something in your heart that costs you to get dressed and, and spend the money to go to seminar after seminar and listen to message after message and speaker after speaker. Because there's something in you that tells you this is not it for you. You have not peaked here. There's more in you that you are expressing. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind. What's in store for you if you challenge yourself, if you persist and persevere, if you take ownership for your life. George Bernard Shaw said the people that make it in this life, they look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. Create what you want. You have the power in you to do the more than you can ever begin to imagine, to control your destiny, to make a difference in our children, to make a difference on the planet, to make an impact. Let us say together, it's me. And let us say together, it's hard. Say it like you know it. Say it's hard. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard. There are people who have seen their retirements taken away from them by the corporations that they work for. They were within two or three years of retiring and they had it taken from them. The number one entrepreneurs in this country now are senior citizens. The number one employer, number two, McDonald's and Walmart. And there's nothing wrong with those jobs. I guarantee you those people did not have a plan to end up living their lives at the end of life with those types of jobs. And they didn't have a plan like you have and while you're investing in yourself not to. And it's hard. There are people making choices between purchasing prescription drugs or paying for gas or a mortgage note. It's hard when you're working on a job for 20 years, 30 years, give them some good years and then they come in and tell you we've downsized. In other ways, other words, you have fired. And then you have to start all over again. How many of you know it's hard? Raise your hands, please. It's hard. And it's not fair. One of the things I like about T. Hobb is he talks about work and investing in yourself. It's not fair when people are going up against that kind of stuff to tell them just think positive and be enthusiastic and everything will work out all right. Ain't that kind of party. It's hard. Life will put some knots on your head. I bought my first home for my mother. I was rushing, didn't know what I was doing, and I bought a home that had a lien against it. And they called me, Mr. Brown, yes, there's a lien against your property. We need $55,000 if you're going to stay there. Wait a minute, sir. I just bought this home. The guy told me there were no liens against it. I'm not the one that owe you the money. You should have checked that out, Mr. Brown. Come on. I called my attorney. We followed up. Yes, Les, there's a lien against the property. But he told me there were no liens. He lied, obviously. Oh, my God. He told me he wanted to help me because he admired the fact that I was buying this home for my mother and that he was adopted and he, he identified with me. Les, he suckered you. He played you, man. So what, well, would they take payment arrangements? Can I, what about $5,000 a month? They want all the money, Les. They want all the money or you're going to have to get out. The house is going up for chef sale. Do you have it? No, I, I don't have it. Can they give me some time? Tell them to give me, give me three months, please. Give me three months. I, my mother's in her 70s, man. She has a bad heart. Don't do this to me. This is my dream. Don't do this, man. Please, let me talk to them. Les, I'm talking to their attorney. They don't want to talk to you. I've got to talk to their attorneys. Do you have the money? No. Will they give me three months? No. What about two months? No, Les. They want the money in seven days. Oh, my God. 
let me call you back, I'm not sure. And I walked the floors thinking, God, how could this happen to me? I gotta figure this out, huh? I gotta figure this out. And it seemed like the days were just ticking off, ticking off. Thursday, I had to call them and let them know. They called me, Les, do you have the money? No, I don't. Friday, you have to leave. The sheriff will be there. You're gonna have to leave, Les. They're gonna take my house. What about my down payment? You lost it, Les. You lost it. Okay, I gotta go, yes. I prayed, Lord, please, if you show me that you're real, if, if, it's, if you're really real, you think Paul worked for you, You've, you haven't seen anything. Don't let me lose this house and watch what I'll do for you. I was trying to cut a deal. <laughs> Have you ever tried to cut a deal? <laughs> it's amazing how spiritual you get when you get in trouble, you know what I mean? When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I was going to bed with the, with the Bible and the Holy Quran and science of mind and Joel Goldsmith, everything I could find. I was paying to Jesus, Yahweh, Melchizedek, everybody. I was calling on everybody. It's amazing. And, and here I was walking the floor at three o'clock in the morning and I had to go and wake my mother up. I got on my knees and I said, Mama, I said, I need you to wake up. She said, what's wrong, Leslie? I can, I can hear you walking back and forth. I'm not asleep, son. I said, there's something I need to tell you. She said, your eyes are red. Why are your eyes red? Because I feel so stupid now. Why? We got to move tomorrow. Why, Leslie? There's a lien against the property and they want $55,000 and I don't have it. And we're going to be set out tomorrow. We have to go back to Liberty City. So she said, it's okay. I don't like this house anyhow. I said, why? She said, because of my arthritic knees. It, helps, it hurts my knees when I go up the steps. I said, and why didn't you tell me? Because you were so happy. I just said it because you were happy. I'll live in a shack with you, boy. I love you. It's not the house. I love you. I love all my children. I said, thank you, Mama. Thank you. And the next day, the next day when we were in the truck going back to Liberty City and we pulled down 68th Terrace, the neighbors came out and said, whoa, Mamie, Mamie, y'all coming back? Are you back? Yes. What happened to the home your boy bought for you? Those boys you adopted. Leslie didn't do a title search. He made a mistake. And boy, I was, I was so humiliated. How many ever made a mistake that you were just humiliated? Raise your hands. I was devastated. I was taking the furniture off the truck and my mother came and I was crying and she said, boy, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, hold your head up. I said, mama, I can't. She said, hold your head up. I said, why? Look what I've done. She said, it's okay. It's okay. You are going to make a lot of mistakes in life, young man. You're going to fail your way to success. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Keep your head up and take that furniture back in the house. I said, yes, ma'am. And I learned something from that. If you ever go through something, hold your head up. If you ever make a mistake, hold your head up. If you ever do something and everything goes wrong, life catch you on the blind side, hold your head up. It's not over. Gerda said, that which does not kill you will make you stronger. Hold your head up. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, hold your head up. Here's something else, ladies and gentlemen. Repeat after me, please. You got to be hungry. Everybody together, you got to be hungry. I'll never forget Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. What do you want to do with your life, young man? 
I said, sir, I want to be a disc jockey. He said, Mr. Brown. I said, yes, sir. He said, you got to be hungry. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. People that are hungry are willing to invest in themselves. People that are hungry will go to seminars and workshops. People that are hungry are always searching, always seeking higher ground. So how do you want to make it? I said, I want to be a disc jockey. He says, good. Here's what to do. He said, I want you to read 10 to 15 pages of something positive every day. He said, you don't get in life what you want. You get in life what you are. You must program yourself to success. He said, I want you to listen to Earl Nightingale and Zig Ziglar. Listen, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. He said, I want you to change your relationships and I don't want you to ever lose your hunger. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, people that are hungry are unstoppable. People that are hungry are no matter what people. They make it happen no matter what. He said, I want you to listen to Paul Harvey. Who is he? He's the world's greatest communicator. Success leaves clues, young man. Always listen and follow people who are doing what it is you want to do at the level you want to do it and learn from them. I told T. Hobb when we were standing by the stage, I said, hey man, I want to work more with you. I want you to coach me. I want to learn from you. See, I found you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. Always have a thirst for learning. So I listened to Paul Harvey every day on the radio. While in school, I would go out and listen in his car. He gave me his keys. I was working to develop myself. And I continued to listen to motivational messages. And he would take me to see the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. I toured with him before he passed. You, you have something special. You have greatness within you. Don't allow your circumstances to determine who you are. Don't allow your negative thoughts to hold you back. You, you have something special. You can do more than you can ever begin to imagine. Dr. Peel was an incredible man. I, I admired him when he spoke. He gave me goose pimples. I can feel him in my heart. And, and I never forget, we were coming back to the school and Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, yes, sir. When Dr. Peel spoke, you didn't move. When he spoke, you were hanging on every word. When he spoke, we didn't have to tell you to sit down and be quiet. Why? I said, sir, I could... I could feel him when he talked. I felt like he was talking to me, sir. He said, he was. I said, but he doesn't know me, but he was speaking to you. Did you feel him in your heart? I said, yes, sir. He said, most people feel him in their head. If you felt him in your heart, he said, listen to him, son. Follow him, learn from him. And I would go to seminars and workshops. Anywhere I would find where Dr. Peel was, I would be in the audience. I would drive two and three hundred miles just to hear him speak. And my dream and vision was, was to share the stage with him. I thought about it. What is your goal? What is your vision? I want you to hold it in mind. There's some power in that. Because when I became involved in speaking, I never forget, I got a call from Og Mandino, who wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. He said, Les, I'm stuck in Philadelphia. I need to be in Kankakee. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale is appearing. I can't make it. I heard you're in Chicago. I said, yes, I am. Can you go and open for me? I said, yes, man, oh my God. Dr. Peel, I said, yes, I'd love to do it. And I went there and I came. I said, hi, I'm, I'm Les Brown. He said, you're not the band of renown? I said, no, I'm, I'm Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. I'm here to speak. He said, come backstage. And his wife, Martha, was there. And she said, Papa, Les Brown is here, the speaker. And he said, Les Brown? Les Brown, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss your land among the stars, I said, sir, that's my quote. I wrote you when I was in the 11th grade. I was a part of a special, special education class project. That's my quote. He said, I know. I end all my speeches with that quote. And Dr. Peel had a great sense of humor. A young man was backstage and I had so many questions to ask him and my mind froze up and the young guy said, 
Dr. Peel, how old are you? And he was up in age. He said, Sonny, I'm, I'm 92. The young man looked at him and said, I don't know if I want to live to get 92. He said, that's because you've never been 91. <laughs> so I did the things that Mr. Washington suggested. I listened to motivational tapes on a regular basis. I would go to seminars and workshops whenever Zig Ziglar and Dr. Dennis Waitley and Jim Rohn would come to town. And I said, sir, I said, what do you want me to do now? He said, Mr. Brown, I've given you everything that I can give you. He said, develop your mind, put your money where your mouth is, continue to learn how to be an effective communicator, because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. And always surround yourself with OQP, only quality people. So I went to apply for a job on Miami Beach. WMBM radio station, Milton Butterball Smith was the program director. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, young man, you have any journalism in your background? I said, no, sir, I don't. You have any experience in broadcasting? I said, no, sir, but I practice all the time, sir. Let me audition for you, sir. Let me show you how good I am. All I need is a shot, sir. He says, no, we don't have any job for you. How many ever been rejected? Raise your hands, please. I was devastated. I went back and I told Mr. Washington, I said, Mr. Washington, they said no. He said, don't take it personally. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, you got to be hungry. Make no your vitamin. Go back again. I said, yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Butterball.